18 year old boy. It was so important to me that I followed that path thinking this might be the secret of happiness, the freedom of Nibbana. And my goodness, it was. This is the path. So we meditate in order to see the Dhamma of peace, of freedom, of ease. It goes in the opposite direction than most people in the world go. Sometimes that people think that all you yogis are absolutely crazy. You had nine days of holiday. Why didn't you go to New York? Why didn't you go to Lankawi? Why didn't you go to some beach somewhere and just sun yourself? Why didn't you go partying? Some of your parents, of you young kids, say, why aren't you at the nightclubs chasing a partner in life? Sometimes people don't understand why people are so happy coming to a retreat. But you go back and you show that happiness to others. Sometimes it's the happiest thing you've ever experienced when you let go and you find this deep sense of peace within. In the Dharma, the Buddha gave this beautiful simile. It was a simile of the seven shipwrecked sailors. It's a simile which describes what enlightenment is and also the path to enlightenment. In this simile, there are seven shipwrecked sailors. The actual sutta doesn't say they're shipwrecked, they're just in the water a long way from land. And I made up the shipwreck because how else would they be in the water a long way from home? <laughs> but nevertheless, seven shipwrecked sailors. The first one goes straight down. Shipwrecked sailor number two goes up and then goes down. Goes up and goes down. Shipwrecked sailor number three floats on the surface. Shipwrecked sailor number four floating on the surface looks around and sees land in the distance. Shipwreck sailor number five, having seen land, starts swimming towards that land. Shipwreck sailor number six is so close to dry land, he's actually in the surf. He doesn't need to swim anymore. He can stand up, there's solid ground underneath him. He's wading to the shore. And the last shipwreck sailor number seven has made it to dry land, He's sitting under the coconut tree having a nice drink and a rest, reading a magazine, whatever else you want to do when you're in the beach. I made up those extra things for the last shipwreck sailor, but it counts. <laughs> in this simile, those seven shipwreck sailors represent the following. Shipwreck sailor number one who goes straight down is someone who hasn't done much good karma but has done a lot of bad karma. They don't keep afloat in life, but they go down. Shipwreck sailor number two is just the ordinary person. They've done some good karma, some bad karma. Now they go down, now they go up, now they go down, now they go up. Little yo-yos in the sea of life. Shipwreck sailor number three, because they've done lots of good karma, they float, they keep their head above water. Whatever happens in this life, they manage to get through it without too much depression, frustration, anger, stress, illness and stuff like that. They reason to be healthy, they reason to be at peace, they're keeping their head above water because of their good karma, their precepts, their charity, their compassionate works. Shipwreck sailor number four, the one who is floating above the water because they're good karma. Then you have the time to look around and see where is the dry land, where is safety. And this is the person who they call the stream winner. You've seen dry land, you've seen safety, you've seen the end of all this suffering. Shipwreck sailor number five is obvious consequence of shipwreck sailor number four. The one up there as well. I can spot cameras. I've got a sixth sense or seventh sense for cameras. <laughs> no paparazzi can catch me. <laughs> so, Shipwreck Sailor number five is the one who's seen the dry land and now who is swimming to the shore is on the way to safety. And that represents the once returner, the Sakadagami, the second stage of enlightenment. Shipwreck sailor number, was it, six, is the one who is standing in the surf. 
I see you. <laughs> Shipwreck sailor number six is the one who is standing in the surf, wading to the shore. They're so close to dry land it hardly matters. That's the anagami, the non-return. They're almost there. And shipwreck sailor number seven, under the coconut tree, sipping a cool draught of coconut, reading the magazines. The job has been done. That's the arahat. They are safe. That's a beautiful description of the Buddha which actually brings the path of enlightenment very clearly to our minds. It's not something which is hard to understand because we understand that in our life we are unsafe. We have suffering, depressions, illnesses, stress, all this stuff which causes turmoil in our lives. Surely there must be some safety somewhere, some place where we can be free from all this suffering, dukkha and pain and arguments and self-hatred and guilt and fear and all this other stuff. So you make good karma, you can float above the surface long enough to be able to see dry land. You understand the goal of life. You see the destination. You see the freedom, the ending of desires. You understand why that is, what that is, the deep peace of Nibbana. When you understand that that is the ultimate happiness, what's going to happen next? You have to be striving towards that happiness. Sure, you can mess around sometimes, but if you know you're in the <coughs> sinking in the water, you obviously be striving to get out, to get to dry land. A person who's on the way is called a once returner, but soon you're standing in the surf. You're still in the water, but almost out of the water. You're so close, the non-returner. And lastly, it's the arahat, fully enlightened. And you know a person has got to these stages. Number one, you know a person's a once returner because they're doing something about it. They're actually practicing. They're letting go of their desires and their cravings. They're letting go of their anger. You know a person's an anagami because they're so pure-hearted, they're not attached to anything much in the world. You know a person's an arahat because they never get angry. They never get upset. They're not craving at all. Which is why that sometimes we test people out. Because sometimes there's so many people come up and say they're stream winners or they're once returners or they're fully enlightened. And sometimes people ask me that. Is this monk? Is this nun? Is this teacher? What do you think, Ajahn Brahma? Are they enlightened? And I'll tell you how you can find out. Do you want to find out? You try and make them angry. You try and upset them. You try and get some anger out of them. That's actually the traditional manner. If somebody went up to Ajahn Chah and said, that I've made it, I've cracked it, I'm enlightened. He said, you stupid idiot, you can't get enlightened. Go away, you idiot. In front of everybody. He do his utmost to make them angry. Just like in this classic story from Japanese Buddhism or Chinese Buddhism. Many, many years ago, there was a young monk who was so intent upon enlightenment. He was not going to mess around. So he asked his abbot if he can go, not just six months in solitude like I did, three years in solitude, or actually however long it took. And there was a little island in a lake close to the monastery. He said, let me build a little hut there, a little hermitage. After I built the hermitage, please let me stay there just to meditate, to study, to become enlightened. All I need, he said, just send over one of the attendants once a week just for some supplies. I won't need much, just to look after myself so I can have perfect seclusion. And the abbot agreed. So there, this diligent young monk, you having built his hermitage, he would be alone in solitude, in this little island, surrounded by a lake, perfect solitude, to meditate all day and all night if he wanted to, to striving for enlightenment. He was such a diligent, such a, a devoted meditator, that after a while he got very peaceful. After a while, insight started to come. 
After a while, he realized he was enlightened. It was after three years, the said decided he needed to tell his master, the abbot, about his great attainment. So when the attendant came one week to bring the supplies, the monk wrote to ask the attendant if he could next week bring some fine paper, some ink and a fine quill. He wanted to write a message. One week later the supplies came, but also a fine piece of parchment, some ink and a quill. He meditated for six whole days to prepare his mind for what he was going to do next. And when his mind was still, when his mind was full of the joy of release, he took out the parchment, dipped the quill in the ink and wrote the following poem in the most exquisite of calligraphy. The diligent monk alone for three years, is no longer moved by the four worldly winds. The diligent monk alone for three years is no longer moved by the four worldly winds. In Buddhism that was a sign that he was enlightened. Nothing could ever move him again. When he finished that calligraphy, when it dried, he looked at it. He smiled, rolled it up, tied it with a ribbon and waited for the attendant to come. He gave the attendant the scroll and then he sat and waited. Waited for the seven days for the answer to come back. He was sure that his abbot would now probably invite him to take over the monastery himself. He'd probably think that maybe if that wasn't the case he'd be invited to take over a big monastery in the capital. He was enlightened. Perhaps that scroll in the most exquisite of calligraphy would be put in an expensive frame and hung in the main dhamma hall of the monastery. It was so wonderful to have made it at last. One week later, the attendant came back. The monk was beside himself with excitement because the attendant gave him a piece of parchment back with a different colour ribbon on the outside. Hurriedly, the monk opened it. He read the parchment. It was his own parchment, but the abbot would scrawl some words over his poem. Over the first line, which said, The diligent monk, the abbot had written the four letters, F-A-R-T in red biro pen. He couldn't believe his eyes. On the second line, alone for three years, the abbot has scrawled in capital letters the same word, fart. (laughs) The third line had the same three letters even in bigger characters with an exclamation mark after it, fart. (laughs) And the last line had the same, this time underlined, Fart! This was too much. This abbot was so stupid he couldn't even see enlightenment when he was in front of his fat stupid nose and he'd made a mess of this exquisite calligraphy which was a work of art, defiling it with graffiti which was a work of a punk, not a monk. He was not going to stand for this. He ordered the attendant to row him back. He was going to see this abbot. It was the first time he left the monastery in three years. He stormed into the abbot's office. He slammed the parchment on the table and demanded an explanation. And the abbot very slowly picked up the parchment and stood up. And he read it out to the irate young monk. The diligent monk, alone for three years, is no longer moved by the four worldly winds, yet four little farts has blown you clean over the lake. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he was blown across the lake by four little farts <laughs> and he realised oh I'm not enlightened so he went back over there and stayed a few more years in the island this is a classic case 
of how we find out if someone's enlightened or not. Try and make them angry. Now, that's actually if you want to test somebody out to see if they're enlightened or not. See if they get angry. Many, and I'm going to tell you the story now of my enlightenment. Do you want to hear this story? Some of you heard it before. I was uh, very quick. I was only a monk, four years as a monk. And I was meditating in this very remote and simple forest monastery in the northeast of Thailand. There was not much work to do there. It was our range retreat. And I was putting forth immense effort in my meditation. One evening, after the service in the evening had finished after most of the monks had gone to bed I was walking meditation sometimes this happens you're walking backwards and forwards and your mind gets so still so still and open full of energy first one insight came up which was very very powerful and it was followed by another and then another it was as if a whole waterfall a fountain of insights would just flow. I couldn't resist them, one after the other. And then, after about half an hour, the big one came. The big insight. Wow, that blew me away. I was almost crying with joy. So peaceful, so clear. This was it. Enlightenment. I was just so happy, so at peace. It was late in the night. You should go to sleep because the morning bell went at three o'clock. Went up to my hut to lay down. I don't know if I did really sleep, just lay down. So peaceful, so mindful. This was in the tropics, usually in the monsoon season up there. You know, I was an English-born monk. Sometimes it's so oppressive, you get so sleepy. No way was I going to get sleepy. I think I got up about 2.15. Went into the hall. You know, didn't mind any mosquitoes, the heat. You just sat meditation there. Very often, that time in the morning, you'd be nodding, sleepy. No nodding that morning. I was bolt upright, with ease, no effort at all. You just watch the breath, you notice it so easily, without any obstacles whatsoever. In deep meditation, Ah, oh, so wonderful being enlightened. We went on arms round that morning. It was just so peaceful. I just everyone who put food in my bowl, I was just sapping them with loving kindness. Because that's what you do when you're enlightened. Just give loving kindness to everybody. Oh, it's so nice. All of you may all be peaceful and happy. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and then came our meal. And what was really surprising that morning, that usually the food in that part of the world 30 years ago was absolutely disgusting. I've already mentioned the story of the frog and rice. The usual fare we got was usually, we had a ball of sticky rice. The only other thing we had was a, a pot of rotten fish curry. And it was made out of rotten fish. What they used to do was actually they used to catch fish only in the paddy fields in the rainy season and they'd store it throughout the rest of the year and this was the beginning of the rainy season they were still using the fish caught the year before what they used to do just put it in an earthenware pot and then just put a piece of plastic over it I found one of those pots once in the monastery where I was cleaning up it was full of maggots the plastic had broken the flies had laid their eggs in there, it was crawling with maggots. So I picked it up to throw it away. As it happened, the headman of the village, the most educated, knowledgeable, refined man in the whole village, saw me. He said, what are you doing? I said, look, it's got maggots in it, I'm throwing it away. He said, give it to me, that's extra protein. <laughs> the next morning, we had rotten fish curry. It was rotten, it smelt rotten, and it tasted rotten. <laughs> but that's all you had. Just a of sticky rice and rotten fish curry. 
But that morning, the morning of my enlightenment, we had two pots. Now, I'd, I'd, as you know, I was a vegetarian.